Hello again everyone, we've made it. We've made it to the bloody summer holidays. Beautiful sunny day, we've got some test cricket on the radio and some cool chemistry to do. It's been a bit of a tough year 2020, as I know it has been for everyone, but um, it's looking like things are going to improve. So I hope that's the case for you as well. Things are on the up. So what have we got planned for today? Let's take it away, other camera. We've seen this reaction scheme before, in fact, this exact one last episode. But the difference was last episode, we didn't actually have these reagents and we made them last episode. So now we are in possession of everything we need to be able to do this reaction. So we're finally doing it. We're turning our psychopentanone ketal into uh, the tribromo cyclopentanone ketal um, using elemental bromine and dioxane. As per usual, we're drawing from two papers from the CSIRO in Victoria. Shout out to the CSIRO in Victoria. Thanks for tweeting at me. That was really fun. So if you're watching, hello. I'm continuing to butcher your work, but um, <laughs> thanks for writing these papers. But also another resource I found which will be quite useful now and, and going forward is from 1989 out of um, the US uh, Naval Research Labs. So shout out to the US War Machine for uh, continuing to bring us good papers. They provide these reaction details in, in, in quite a lot of detail. Details and detail. The obvious one, of course, is the use of dioxane. As I've mentioned before, it's it's uh, a chemical that's used quite a lot in home chemistry because it's made easily from, well, okay, I won't say easily. <laughs> oh, fuck. How do I keep letting this happen? Can be made from ethylene glycol, which is a very available uh, chemical. So it, it, it seems like uh, a modification that I've made to this procedure, but no, according to this um, 1989 um, research paper, they really tried to use a lot of different solvents other than dioxane, and dioxane was the only one that worked. So dioxane is actually necessary for this reaction to happen. They speculate that this is a thing that gets brominated, so you actually turn the dioxane into dibromine dioxane or something like that, and then that species then brominates the uh, the ketal. However, they do drop another key bit of information because if we scan down and have a look at our reagents, Go down here. So first of all, look how nice they are. If you've been following my channel, it's rare that we start from reagents that are this nice. <laughs> Especially when they've all been made from hardware chemicals, basically. Maybe it's just the containers that give me this false sense of um, security about their, their purity. Really, we got quite a bit of bromine, a decent amount of our ketal. But we don't have a whole lot of dioxane. It's actually frozen at the moment. It's been in the fridge. But um, we don't have a whole lot of it. And what's frustrating is it's kind of the limiting thing in this case because we need it both as a reagent, as, as a bromination sort of species in the middle, but also as a solvent because we need everything dissolved. The paper from the research lab mentions that you can actually use DCM as a solvent as well. So as long as you've got the dioxane in there, that's fine. You can use much smaller amounts of it and then use just DCM to keep everything dissolved. So that's what we're going to do. This is my dichloromethane. This came from Paint Stripper from the same hardware store everything else is coming from. Um, I distilled it uh, from the Paint Stripper. It comes over with some methanol, but then um, I redistilled it and then distilled it over... Um, phosphorus pentoxide. Now phosphorus pentoxide is a very good dehydrating agent. It's not something you find at your hardware store. It's not something you find very easily at all. And I did that because I just wanted to. Sometimes I just do chemistry because I want to. Um, I just wanted to see how it worked and, and getting this stuff really dry. Um, we need all the stuff really dry, but I did cheat a little bit on our hardware sort of uh, getting things from hardware stores by, by using phosphorus pentoxide. But we won't count it because it's not a reagent. As I've mentioned and re-mentioned, um, the difficult part about this is the fact that it, it has to be dry. I'm actually going to dry that out over some sieves before we um, run this thing. I've, I have re-distilled the bromine. That was something I, I didn't mention last episode. It was, you know, fine. You know, a lot of time, but um, it's it's there. So the bromine is dry. Well, you know, everything is dry, but we'll just overdo it with some sieves because um, this is particularly water sensitive and dioxane does tend to absorb water from the atmosphere over time and it's been a little while since I made it. So yes, anyway. Oops, I accidentally set one on fire. I think it was that one there. It just started going very orange. So uh, yes, 10 second burst at most. Oh, it's very hot. These are looking pretty damn dry. There's not really much water coming off and they're, they're very hot. So I'm gonna cool these down over vacuum, which should um, get the last little bits of water out. It's 
Some of you were probably already about to comment like, hey, shouldn't you not put flat bottom flasks under vacuum while they're hot? Doesn't that deform the glass? Normally I'd be like, ah, nah, this vacuum isn't strong enough for that. It's not going to deform. It's not that hot, but look at this. Look at the bottom of the flask. It's got all sucked in under the vacuum. What happens is the sieves are so hot that they actually heat up the glass enough that it's slightly malleable and then put this sealed flask under, under vacuum and it starts to deform. All right, it's dreadful. I should... Not do that, don't do that. You should be doing this with a round bottom flask. Much better structural integrity you, you, because it's all um, circular. It's very cool. Doesn't um, <laughs> have a flat surface to deform like this. That's uh, pretty terrible. Ah, oh well. At least the sieves are dry. ready to go. That bromine's doing its best to be an escape artist as it tends to do. We've got our DCM cyclopentanoide ketal dioxane mixture here. It's cooling slightly. Uh, temperature is really the difficult part of this reaction. Well, I haven't tried it before. This is what I'm thinking is a difficult part of the action looking at this prep. It says if we go over 30 degrees at all, even for 10 minutes, it'll get destroyed. It won't work at all. <laughs> we can run this reaction for just a couple of hours to completion at 27 degrees. But if we go three degrees higher, it just tars up apparently. So what is recommended or what, what people seem to do with this reaction is to go uh, slightly colder, like 20 degrees or so, and then run it overnight and then it still runs to completion. So normally you'd think watching this channel, normally I'd go the fast and loose method where we crank it up, we try and get exactly, uh, you know, as hot as we can, and then we try and do it as quick as possible. Instead, I'm gonna do the, uh, the slow and more thoughtful method just because then I put all my problems onto future Tom tomorrow, <laughs> who hopefully is a lot wiser and um, has more time to do things. Oh, also, yes, the authors ran this under uh, nitrogen atmosphere. It might just be keep out water, but it might also be uh, prevent oxygen getting in, which um, is a big, much bigger of a deal. I'm not running it under a bloody nitrogen atmosphere. Hopefully everything doesn't blow up because, you know, it might generate a lot of gas and I'm keeping it sealed. So I'm trying to make that balancing act between protecting it but also not letting it blow up so there's a there's a line there i'm trying to walk also light coming in you know using bromine tends to have some reaction with uv i think that's a little bit overdone but i will try to protect this from the light just so that we negate that possibility from um you know ruining our yields because if we get a shit yield everyone will comment oh it's because of the uv the sun was coming in and yes we will try and block it out. Not for the moment because I don't want to use alfoil and a bromine at the same time. And fuck off, spider. Spiders are so quick. This I just put this down. Don't build a web around my fucking bromine. I literally just put that down, all right? Do not build a fucking web. Now fuck off. Fuck off. Go. Uh, putting off a lot more gas than I thought it would, so it's uh, venting a little bit. Uh, the drip rate's reasonably slow. Oh, it's not that slow, but yeah, you see it. <laughs> Give me off clouds of bloody, um, I assume, hydrobromic acid fumes. Not the healthiest, 
and um, yeah, not the best system for it then, obviously. Don't want things doing that, but I also can't just have it open. I suppose I might have to, but oh well, we'll just run it like this for a little while. I have to watch it, because uh, if I leave it, it'll, <laughs> it'll explode everywhere, and uh, I don't want that. So, yeah, not heating up a lot, um, adding the bromine um, reasonably fast now, but it is putting off a lot of gas. I think that's a sign it's working, right? I think so. Anyway, pretty uh, goddamn corrosive. Really can't put the stopper on there. I could before, but now it's producing heaps and heaps, so. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this, i got to say. Really got to think of a better way of doing this if I've got to do this again. Like a scrubber or something. I mean, the paper mentions a scrubber and I just neglected that bit. But I should have got one. Ah, this is dreadful. Dreadful, dreadful. But, hey, maybe it'll still work. So, we just keep going. Alright, somewhat stopped violently outgassing <laughs> hydrobromic acid fumes. Obviously the gas needs to escape, but I can't let any water get in and the hydrobromic acid is so hydroscopic you can see some water collecting in around that neck there because that acid vapour, you know, really pulls water from the air very quickly. So we may have stuffed everything up. Um, it's looking very tarry, but maybe it'll look like that. If it's, you know, maybe it's meant to look like that is what I mean. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm heating it up now. The room temperature is about 25 degrees, which is about where we want it. So I'm just letting it warm up on its own. I'm not using any heating. We're sitting in this water, which is still pretty cold. So it was about 15 degrees. So I'll let it just warm up over the next little while. We will continue on. All right, I've just done now what I probably should have done at the start, which is put a drying tube on. So this allows gas to escape because it's just loosely packed calcium chloride in there. Well, not that loosely packed, but packed calcium chloride in here. And any air can go back this way, but it gets stripped of its moisture by the calcium chloride here. So you can have gas exchange, but you can't have any moisture get back into the flask. Oh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it could have had a stopper. It's not venting that much HBR gas. But at this point, um, I am going to leave it overnight. Um, it looks like... A dreadful sign <laughs> um uh it's not good at all but um we'll let that go overnight it's at about 20 degrees uh it's not going to get much colder than that tonight oh i mean it might get to 15 degrees or so but it's not going to get too much hotter than 25 tomorrow hopefully before i come back and we get to do some work up on it and hopefully everything will be all okay so we've made it to the next morning unscathed. I've just uncovered it, uh, none of the things popped off, uh, and it looks like tar. So that's really not great, but um, let's just do the work up and see if we can um, salvage anything from this. Hell yeah, let's do it. Alright, here is our DCM solution. It's noticeably dense. Even for DCM, it's um, very heavy, which is a good sign because our brominator product should be pretty heavy because those bromines are heavy. Uh, in here we have our dichloromethane, we have our dioxane, which apparently isn't really removed in the water washes because it dissolves so well in DCM. Any unreacted ketow, we have, you know, the monobrominated, the dibrominated, and the tribrominated. Hopefully, given the length of the reaction, most of the brominated ones are the tribromo. We don't have too much of the di or the monobrominated one. It's currently over some anhydrous sodium carbonate and um, just a few molecular sieves. I'm trying to remove the water from this. I'm not doing a great job of it, but I'm going to filter it into this 
flask and we're going to be removing the solvent so the paper we're following does this under vacuum they obviously just rotovap it which is a cool bit of equipment that i don't have so i'm just going to be doing you know unrotary evaporation so i'm just going to blow some air through it give it some very gentle heat because we want to remove pretty much all the dichloromethane we want to remove dioxane as well but we don't want to heat it up to 100 degrees or anything like that but i think there's only a little bit of dioxane left so we should be able to if we just blow some air through it and give it some gentle heat the dioxane should evaporate off and we'll be left with potentially an oil of our brominated um, species which we want to then crystallize out which um, we will do by performing some black voodoo magic and um, praying to some gods and hopefully it does crystallize out it is a bit more yellow than my liking i mean it's orange and orange is okay i guess i'm taking it because it looks a lot less like tar than it did before All right, this has been sitting at, oh, the water's 50 degrees or so. So um, it's been sitting here for about half an hour, yeah. So uh, all the DCM has been removed. I was hoping to remove a little bit of the dioxane. It's, you know, somewhat volatile. Got the air flowing in and it's it's warmed up, so should be able to remove volatile stuff. But there's still quite a bit of liquid left. So hopefully it's our, it's our product. It's worth noting that it's a pretty weird smell coming off this, like, moldy towel that you use at the swim center from like the pool chlorine, but also like the weird towel mold kind of thing. It's kind of like that, but a little bit more synthetic. That's the kind of smell that comes off this thing. First method I'm gonna to try to get this to crystallize out is the lazy method. Uh, I'm just gonna put this into <laughs> the freezer overnight and uh, see if it crystallizes out. Will this work? Um, probably not, but um, I'm tired and I need an iced coffee so um, that's the method we're going to do and um, if it doesn't work tomorrow when we come back we'll um, <laughs> try something else but uh, for now let's just chuck it in the freezer and um, send it some thoughts and prayers. Here we are the next day and hell yeah I mean it could all be dioxane frozen in there because it's been in the freezer and dioxane freezes at uh, some reasonably not too cold temperature looks better than that it looks like there's some solid in here it looks really good it looks like our lazy method has actually worked so what i'm going to do is i'm going to let this warm up slightly i'm going to add some water to it water should crash out any uh, remaining stuff from the dioxane and dissolve the dioxane filter wash with a little ice cold methanol and then dry thoroughly on the pump So it actually hasn't crystallized out. <laughs> I was really optimistic, but you see that water there, but then below the water, there's this horrible orange liquid layer, and that's our product. So we've got a lot of product, but um, if I try to filter this now, I'm worried that all our product will just go straight through the filter because uh, it's not really a nice solid. Um, we're gonna have to try and crystallize it out. It was seeming very solid because the dioxane was mixed in with it and the dioxane was frozen but once the dioxane gets dissolved in the water and stops being a solid our trobromide product really um <laughs> doesn't really form a nice solid maybe I'll, I'll give it a go filtering but um it might get a little bit messy All right, look at that. We have solid. It has crystallized out. Obviously, it's really fucking yellow. It always goddamn is. The methanol was was uh, washing some of that color out, but it's also washing a lot of the product out. You can see it sort of crashing out down here, but not crashing out well, not really forming a solid here. So getting this solid back out of here might might be a big issue. Uh, this isn't all of it. Uh, I've still got uh, quite a bit more in the flask. This is just a test to see if it actually stayed in the filter paper. Let's try and get some of this color out. I'm just gonna add a little bit of uh, thiosulfate to this water solution above the orange. Hopefully that takes some of the color out. And then we um, if we'll filter the rest off and hope it the rest of it crystallizes just like this.
here we go. Here's our final yield. It's uh, this is the first little batch that I tried out. It is a little bit yellow, but um, it did lighten up considerably with some ethanol washes, so I'm feeling really confident about it. All in all, we got 17.5 grams, 43% yield, which you know isn't great, but also the papers that we're following only get around 50 to 60% uh, percent yield anyway, just for this step. Uh, and so I'm really happy with this. So we lost a lot there. Um, this is all our bromide washings from earlier with like the set funnel. So there's probably a lot of product in there. Should really do a melting point test before we're um, too confident about it. Should melt around um, 70 to 80 degrees. Yeah, absolutely excellent. So, um, I won't say easily. 